Hey, welcome everyone. Welcome to my session at the GCP conference. Uh, my name is Dave. I'm a, by day, I'm a, Howdy. by day, I'm an instructional designer at the Online Learning Center. And by night, two times a year, I teach online for math and computer science. So today I'm going to be showing you some examples from my own personal courses and how I have attempted to increase my own personal presence, instructor presence, and increase the social presence of my students in their courses as well. Much of what I'll be sharing with you today is um, something that I've also been involved with over the last two years through a MOOC called The Human Element, an essential online course component. Um, it's a free MOOC through the Canvas network. Last year it drew 700 students online. Uh, we had about 100 active participants in the MOOC, but we did have 700 students actually physically enrolled in the MOOC. Um, and it starts up again in November, and I'll tell you some more about that, more information about that later on at the end of the presentation as well. First thing I'd like to do is attribute some of key things. For example, all of these icons are from the Noun Project. You can get free vector images from the Noun Project that you can use for educational purposes as long as you attribute their authors. So here's the authors of these images. I didn't purchase them. They're free vector images that I can download and use for e-learning or my own educational purposes. I'm also going to be using lots of images from Flickr Creative Commons, and I'm going to be putting those images down, references to the authors of those images down here in the lower left. And over here on the right, I'll try not to block the screen, but I'm actually going to be attributing the, the original authors of the research that I'm going to be sharing, because not all of these ideas are my own. So I'm going to do my best to mention the authors, but I'm, their references are down here at the lower, lower level. Dave, I'm sorry. Yes. Will this be available in all to participants? I mean, some, some of the text is kind of difficult to see for reference, if we're taking notes on references. Yeah, oh, Elvira nice said my good. PowerPoint's going to be good at full screen. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, I can send it to you. So, who teaches face-to-face who teaches face -face and who teaches online? Maybe raise your hand if you teach just face-to-face -face for, for Webster. No, only. Only face-to-face -face for Webster. Okay. What about if you teach just online? Do we have any purely online instructors here? I'm guessing not. What about if you teach both face-to-face -face and online? Okay, great. Um, so much of what I'm going to talk about today can apply to both, both worlds. Maybe you teach face-to-face and you use your Web Enhanced Shell to maybe put up some, some types of quizzes and lecture material, readings, things like that. Um, if you're teaching face-to-face, -face, um, are you interested in flipping your classroom? What is flipping the classroom? That would be where you take some of your material that you would normally provide in a face-to-face -face class and you put as much of that lecture material as you can in an online setting that would allow your students to access and participate in before they show up to class. Uh, this would be a great way to maybe you can put your quizzes online so you don't have to take up, take up class time for quizzes. Maybe you put uh, reading material or your lecture maybe that you've recorded uh, online. So the students come to class and they could actually do a project in a small group. Maybe they come to class and you have some sort of engaging discussion. So who of you would be interested in flipping your face-to-face -face classroom? Great. Almost all of you. Good. So I'm hoping today this will apply. Who of you is... These slides are, must be done actually. Okay, so I'm guessing many of you are some sort of a social media user, or maybe you're just a non user. But on the spectrum of social media, uh, I would define a power user as someone who heavily uses some sort of social media. Another thing I want to mention is this presentation is social media agnostic, so I'm not going to be talking to you specifically about Twitter or Facebook. Um, so, in terms of social media, power user would be someone who uses it very heavily. Someone, an active user, maybe you use it a little bit here and there. Maybe a passive user, you have an account, but you don't really get into it, do it too much with it, unless there's maybe a reason to. Maybe a, grand, uh, a parent or a sibling or somebody posted a photo of you, you go in and say some little comment. And then an absent user, that's someone who has an account, but you really don't even use the service. And then a non-user. So who in here would consider themselves a non-user of social media? Okay. What about an absent user? social media. Okay. Passive user. Okay. Active user. What about a power user? A few of you. Cool. Great. Um, I would say that maybe some of you could be power users on one surface, but then a uh, passive user on another surface. So that's something to think about as well. We all know that our students are social media users, right? 
So our learners desire something human. First question today is, do our e-learning students feel like they are learning alone? Uh, that's the first question that I'm going to kind of throw out today. So essentially, our online students so our online students are learning alone. Whether they're spending time with you in the classroom and then they go home to do part of the flipped lesson, essentially they're sitting at home by themselves. There's advantages to that. They can take an online class in their pajamas. But essentially our students, when they go home, they are learning alone. Michelle Pacancy Brock writes a book, Best Practices for Teaching with Emerging Technologies. She talks about how essentially our students and even ourselves are in physical isolation when they're in an online class. They're sitting there by themselves in an online class, and they essentially, potentially can feel like they're learning alone. But there's things that we can do to make sure that they don't feel like they're learning alone. Um, but when a learner does feel like they're learning alone, essentially, it increases their anxieties about their learning. It may dis decrease their use of the technology. And as I mentioned in the MOOC earlier, we had 700 students, and we only had about 100 of them actually really participate. It decreases the learner's successful completion of the e-learning experience. In the MOOC that I was talking about, we actually only had 56 students, of the 700, 56 students physically complete every single module. And our goal today is to talk about ways to make sure that our learners don't feel alone. Because there are things that we can do. So why do they feel alone if they are so connected? 91% of all adults have their mobile phone in arm reach every single hour. I'm guessing every single one of you in the room, your mobile phone is in your pocket or holding in your hand right now. 25% of Americans use their mobile phone to access the internet. On average, technology users carry 2.9 devices with them at all times. Who in here has two devices that can access the internet with them right now? Anybody have three? <laughs> one person, cool. What, what, what are your three devices? Phone, iPad, MacBook. Very good, exactly. He's a power user. That's right. He's a power user. As, as I'm tweeting, as we can Yeah. I was hoping that Kit Barton from our London campus is here, and I was going to make, this is the time, I, he was supposed to come to the session. I was going to make a joke that he came all the way here from London, and I was going to be tweeting to London about the GCP and saying, social, you know, Ford's uh, hashtag social presence or something like that. 350 million Snapchat messages are sent every day. 144 million visitors visit Facebook every day. There are 53 million tweets every day, and 9,000 tweets are happening at TPS, tweets per second. So right now, there's 9,000 tweets, 9,000 tweets. And then the most fun statistic to throw up here is that there's more people on the planet that own a phone than own a toothbrush. Two. <laughs> there's, there, there, there's an app for brushing teeth. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, Maybe we're, just, maybe we're just lonely people. That's why we try to be so connected, right? Uh, I came across an article recently in Wired Magazine that really helped me conceptualize a lot of the things I've been wanting to say about social presence. Um, here's the first paragraph that I am going to want to read to you. The history of the internet is one of lonely people trying to find one another. Consider AOL, MySpace, Google, Facebook, and Twitter. Ultimately, they're all about communicating with each other. We look into a glowing screen and see something human, but the best of these services allow something human to look back at us. And when technology just melts away, it almost feels like we're not alone. So let's talk more about that, not being alone. The internet has advanced here recently, so much so within the last few years that we can tweet, we can Skype, we can Instagram, we can Vine. Who's anybody familiar with Vining? One pro, two, two people. Creating six second videos that you share. It's caps, it's six seconds, I believe, right? Um, and then Facebook. But it's important to realize that all of these events, all of these types of things occur all around the world. So it's not just America. We're communicating all around the world. This is a social thing. And we generally can experience certain types of events in real time. In 1971, some of you might remember Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. Essentially, you were with your families, maybe watching this by yourself, you're watching this television, cast it on television, but you were experienced that in physical isolation alone to your own home. Um, here's an image of a family watching the same moon landing. Television has talked to us for decades, but it's never listened. So what do I mean by never listening? Well, the Grammys, this past Grammys, this past year, there was 470,000 tweets that were going on during the course of the Grammys. 
and the peak usage, the peak tweet time, was at 9.50 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm not familiar with this band, Imagine Dragons and Kendrick Lamar, but there was 171,000 tweets that were going on at that very moment when the Grammy was going on this past year. During the Sochi Olympics, the most tweeted moment of the Sochi Olympics was during the US and Russia shootout match. All of us were online, maybe not, anybody in this room, were you guys tweeting about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. You may be familiar with this image and this tweet. Ellen wrote, if only Bradley's arm was longer, best photo ever, hashtag Oscars. This tweet, broke Twitter. Yeah, hang on. This, <laughs> this, tweet, this tweet was retweeted 1 million times, 19,570 times. But what you may not know is that this all occurred in 15 minutes and it crashed Twitter. If you check it out, the tweet today, I checked the statistics yesterday, and to date, there's been 3 million tweets about this one photo, retweets about this photo. Now, when you think of retweets, most likely people aren't retweeting this multiple times. So some people are, but generally think there's about 3 million people tweeting about this event and sharing this amazing selfie, right? Best selfie ever. Maybe we just wanted to talk. Is this, a, is this a way where we're all kind of getting together and talking online about these events? Or is it more than just talking? This global conversation cast is rolling out across all social networks. So it's not just Twitter, it's not just Facebook, all social networks. There's this global conversation cast. You may have seen this advertising campaign from the Demi and Ashton Foundation. Movie stars are holding up signs that say, real men don't buy girls. And they're posting these photos on Twitter. I'm guessing you may be more familiar with this Twitter photo that happened a couple weeks ago with Michelle Obama holding up a sign that said, bring back our girls. So this could be, whether it's advertising, activism, we're using these social media outlets to get our word across, to connect socially. And also, not just movie stars and public figures are doing these types of tweets. People like ourselves are holding up signs, act, being activists, going on, on Twitter and posting photos similar to this as well and also retweeting and talking about this social event, hashtag Green Metro Girls. Also, politically, all around the world, uh, people that didn't have a voice are having a voice now through social media. We've heard, we've talked about things like Arab Spring where citizens are able to connect on their social media, even though that the, the governments are limiting what goes outside in terms of what types of news is shared out, they're still using, able to use social media to get their, to get their word out about what's happening in those countries. In 2005, we have the, we have the Papua inauguration, and this is a, a picture of this event. And sociologists have taken this picture of this event and compared it to the event, the same event that happened in 2013. Looks very differently. If you look close, in the 2005, we do see one person with a phone. It's a flip phone. They're probably taking a photo for themselves. Mm -hmm. But now, in 2013, the photo is much different. Now, in 2013, the photo is much different. They're sharing this probably with other people that couldn't show up to the event. They're taking photos. Maybe they're for themselves, but they're most likely I'm guessing they're posting it on Twitter and Facebook and other things like that. Experiencing this event with not just the people that are there, but also the global community. So essentially our learners are desiring something human. Our learners are desiring something human. They want to connect with each other. They want to connect globally. And what we're going to posit today is that they do want this also, not just socially and social media, they also want this in their online classes. Any questions before I move on? So what does this mean for e-learning? This is the question. Oh, we can, yeah. Yep. What, what does this mean for e-learning? Or a be, perhaps a better question would be, um, what's happening here that isn't happening in our e-learning? So if we could, let's all just kind of share some thoughts. What's happening in social media versus what's happening in e-learning? Or what's happening in, e in social media that's not happening in our e-learning? Any thoughts? Cross-cutting communication. So you say cross-cutting? Cross-cutting, across, across the whole group that, that is supposedly present. What else? Uh, Canvas is only for Webster community. Okay. <clears throat> Many of my online students approach what we're doing very instrumentally as, as something just 
to check off and get through and, and not as something more authentic. So it, you would guess that they want something more authentic? Um, I don't know that they do want something more authentic. Oh. <laughs> there would be many of my online students come, it seems to me, come to the class <clears throat> thinking that it's a thing they can do on their own and get through it. Yeah. Sure. What else? Um, social media is non-hierarchical, can be non-hierarchical, mm -hmm. is less hierarchical. What do you mean by that? Um, well, certainly as opposed to a class, and it gets to the instrumentality, if I'm doing what the teacher wants me to do, whereas I'm going to take a picture of, the, of myself. With the you do whatever you want, post it with it. No. Chris? Uh, the communication conversations in social media tend to be more like what you would hear in an actual face-to-face -face dialogue quite often, whereas sure. it's a little more official. So social media... <laughs> More like you know, natural, so to speak, yeah. but it's formal, yeah. real, more natural, like face to face. And to piggyback on that, quite often, it uh, contains a lot more bias and a lot less respect. At times. Social media, yes, sure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My classes, hopefully, we your have classes are just as disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> we have trolls in our classes, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> What else? I have had, yeah, I've had yeah. trolls in face to face classes. Yeah. They sit, in, they sit in the back and don't really say anything. They, they sit like this until they throw a bomb. Yeah. yeah. They sit in the back of the class and get trolls. <laughs> kind of like you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's possible in e learning to put passion into it, mm -hmm. but most of the time in my classes, the students are just talking about something that they read about. But in social media, they're all excited about their shoes or their whatever. I agree. Their shoes. Well, yeah. they're okay. invested yeah. in that conversation. I Someone know. posted something about them. So yeah, it seems to be more like Pinterest. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the visual. There's not as much visual. Could be. So there's not as many visuals. Anymore. Yeah, for the visual learning. Yeah. What else? more things. I was going to say that it's, they're not graded on the things that you showed us. We <coughs> thought about that a little bit more and actually, I mean, they, kind they of are. sort of are, right? With lights like, and like, 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 so I don't know, I mean, maybe it's a more, you know, intrinsic motivation instead of the extrinsic kind of thing. I found myself wanting the like button in discussions. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Like, I, if, if I make a comment that intrudes in the flow of the interaction that the students are having, it would be nice just to be able to give a pat of some sort and let it keep going. I was recently in a MOOC from Stanford, and in their MOOCs, they actually have the ability to like posts and promote posts and things like that. So students go into the discussion area and they see that, oh, my, my promotes is third from the top. Yeah. And they might have been the person who posted 100 or something yeah. like that. So they do have that. Canvas doesn't have that. But Canvas does take requests. So <laughs> we, can, we can submit those. What's the question? Janet. It seems like the online students often need to learn how to discuss things, to go beyond <coughs> the statement or the fact or the check mark, but that there should be exchange. So the evaluation and the discussion is really important. Yeah. Right. yeah, learning and essentially learning on social media versus learning in, for professionally in an e-learning classroom is a little bit, a little, little different. And there does need to be some clear expectations on how to make that learning experience really successful. Show a quick video that talks about uh, some of the things that we're talking about right now. For each of us, there's a moment of discovery. We turn a page, we raise a hand, and just then, in the flash of a synapse, we learn that life is elemental. And this knowledge changes everything. We look around and see the grandness of the scheme. Sodium bonding with chlorine, carbon bonding with oxygen, hydrogen bonding with oxygen. We see all things connected. We see life unfold. And in the dazzling brilliance of this knowledge, we may overlook the element not listed on the chart. Its importance so obvious, its presence is simply understood. The missing element 
is the human element. And when we add it to the equation, the chemistry changes. Every reaction is different. Potassium looks to bond with potential. Metals behave with heart and resolve. And hydrogen and oxygen form desire. The human element is the element of change. It gives us our footing to stand fearlessly and face the future. It is a way of seeing. It gives us a way of touching. Issues, ambitions, lives. The human element. Nothing is more fundamental. Nothing more elemental. Such a beautiful commercial from the Dow Chemical <laughs> So my next question is, does, does every e-learning experience need to have this human element? Because I think we're all sitting here saying, yes, every e-learning experience needs to have this human element. And I would agree. But some courses, depending on the objectives of the learner, the objectives of the instructor, the objectives of the institution, maybe it doesn't need to have a human element. And that's fine. Many MOOCs are set up this way. And similar to how we order fast food. We drive up to a fast food restaurant, we know exactly where it is, we look at a glowing screen that's very organized by price and types of food. We quickly go in, we pick exactly what we want, we quickly can order it, it's very cheap. We then get handed to us in a wrap package, we can go sit and eat it in our cars, we can go home with it. But essentially, we can get access to exactly what we want and do what we want. I'm currently in I'm currently in three different MOOCs right now, and I'm not probably going to complete them. But I am going in there, and I'm consuming exactly what I want to consume, and it's very cheap, easy, easy accessible. Question, Chris? Well, it's or it's just something to, to, to an observation based on even on our smaller scale classes that occur here. I think there is a certain um, there is a certain uh, archetype of learner who actually one of the pros that they see is the learning and I is the ability to kind of just do this kind of like I want this and this and this and I want it when I want it and I if I want to complete this course within the next two weeks that's on me and if I don't need to interact with others that's cool uh, because I, I was you know what I taught my online course uh, last time I'm like let's you know high contact like high communication and there was there was a certain a measurable percentage that actually recoiled yeah. from it and they were like this, this I teach computer science courses, and believe me, they don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> they they would just want to code. They want to code, submit their website. They don't. It was very new to them to take a computer science course and feel like I'm supposed to share my website with other students in the class and talk about it. Yeah. They, and, they're not used yeah. to it. And some of it was. Some of it might have been like you know whether you want to call it antisocial or you know uh, introversion or whatever. Mm -hmm. But some of them I think it was just like this. What you spoke spoke about this like kind of learning on my terms and having. Mm -hmm complete control over the learning experience. Which and that is an advantage of e-learning. And I think we do need to assume that some of our e-learners are like that. They're military students who are very busy. CEOs of companies, perhaps. And they need to know all the clear expectations up front and be able to get, get in and out, perhaps, what they want from them. But then some of us would like to have take the experience that we have in the classroom and figure out how to have that human element. So here we have an image of a family sitting down to a home-cooked meal. I'm guessing that this family was excited to come together for this meal. They're all sitting here very interested in what each other has to say. When they leave this meal, they're probably going to be remembering conversations that occurred at this table. They're going to carry on with them. And they're also going to be excited to come back the following evening for dinner and having this conversation again. And I think that we can have the same types of experiences in our online courses, depending on the objectives of the student and uh, the institution and things like that, if that's what we want. I, would, I, would, I think it's safe to say at Webster, most of our online courses, we would want this type of interaction. It's interesting you use this, you use this as the example after the fast food, because so few people do this anymore. Sure, sure. And they go to fast food exactly for what you described, which is what I don't like about it. Yeah. Not that I'm, I don't have the time to do this either, but mm -hmm. our world is changing. It is. We're, perhaps we're because of social media. Yeah, because, perhaps because of social media. <coughs> Chris. And I have a question. Maybe you'll talk about this uh, down the road. Um, do you think that some of these kinds of interactions that we want are easier to achieve in a synchronous teaching style? Uh, or uh, but. Do you, you know, like this dinner table conversation? I mean, you know, uh, 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 that that's a synchronous event. And, and it takes it takes some instructional strategy, and I think there is ways to incorporate 
synchronous course, synchronous elements in our online courses. It's very rare to have that right now at Webster, but I know that the administration and all of us in this room are probably very interested in having those types of synchronous moments in online courses, but even with asynchronous discussion boards and things like that. I'm going to show you examples of my courses on how I try to have this dinner table conversation. Question? And, and I get, well, um, to more, more of a comment, but I'm, but I'm thinking that, you know, if this is a GCP collaboratory, how does the integration of skills and knowledge areas and the overall aim of uh, contributing to the university's mission <laughs> in terms of uh, being able to give students because students all around the world are coming to our classes. I'm about to teach my online Co-op 2000 class, and I've already spoken with, on the phone, with a student from Singapore and Vienna. I mean, so, and I'm telling them that, hey, we're, we're not just learning alone. We're not just making websites, posting them to me. We're not just reading from the book and taking a quiz. We're actually going to be connecting online, sharing our own personal websites that they're making, connecting with. We're going to have a community of learners. And I, I put all of this up front so they know about it. And I probably will have a few students that resist. Students that may drop, but then the students that do stick with it, I, I'm hoping, and I, I believe they do have a very rewarding experience. Other, other thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to comment on the fact that, you know, as I think about MOOCs and how we vision e-learning, part of that is understanding um, the student's culture and how they interact with one another, and that does play a role in our, in our e-learning environment, whereas how we act in the United States is very different with social media than happens in India, Egypt, et cetera, and so forth. Just keeping that as part of our framework of, of class setup and expectations of interactions online. Mm -hmm. All right, good to be more. <clears throat> so when we talk about social and instructor presence, um, for the sake of time, I, I was going to bring this up and we could try to chat about some ideas, but can we just kind of throw out some ideas of what we mean by social presence, what we mean by instructor presence, and keep in mind that this also can mean, means the same thing in a face-to-face -face class and it means the same thing in an online class. So let's say social presence. What do we mean by social presence? Janet? Regardless of tool, responsiveness. Responsiveness. The, the speed of reply or the getting to the core of the question. Chris, what else? Um, and, and perhaps also the, 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 the frequency or depth of the responses too, you know, you just like taking the time to really, you know, to really engage with someone and, you know, maybe even try to... Because you probably had face-to-face, -face, we've had face-to-face -face classes that the instructor didn't engage the students in conversations very much and students didn't have that type of presence. What else? Yes? Being able to identify specific communications having come from a unique individual with particular characteristics. Exactly. An individual feeling like they are unique, and and, you know, and persistence of that individuated character over the over the course of the interactions. Yeah, you mean like making mention of something that you had shared with them. Earlier? Yeah, there needs to be yeah there needs to be a way to attach history to my interaction with you that that we can leverage in that. Situation. Yeah, one of the things I'll talk about is keeping a running log of notes. You can actually do that in Canvas about your interaction with the student, or keeping just a, a running Word document of notes. So, what project they're working on, where they're from, so you can kind of bring those types of things up in communications. Don. I think that's one of the good things about what we do. We're not doing MOOCs with 700 people. We've got 16. True. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can remember what they've said over the semester, like we do our individual classes. It wasn't a question of whether you could or not. No, no, I, I know. I know. I, know. I mean, it, it's, it's, that's an important part about what we already have I mean, access to. I mean, we do that. And that's what I love about Webster. I think yeah. we would all agree that our goal is to, whether a student is online or face-to-face, -face, our goal is to graduate Gorlocks and not just graduate online students. How does a student at the Vienna campus feel like they're Gorlocks? I thought it was global citizens. Oh, okay. <laughs> global citizens. But you know, how does a student at the Vienna campus or Sorry. Singapore feel like, do they feel like they're a Gorlock? Do they really feel like they're a Webster student yeah. enrolling in these countries? What are, what are thoughts? Um, th this might not be under establishing presence or not, but I think sharing a little bit about yourself, uh, kind of humanizing you and making them feel like, you know. Yeah, and I'll show examples of that. Yeah. What about instructor presence? How can an instructor have presence maybe in a face-to-face class or online? Giving feedback. Yeah, exactly. Especially in discussion. And it always surprises me when students say, wow, I've never had a teacher be so involved in discussion. I am not. All I'm doing is reading what they're saying and commenting. I'm not. A, I just wonder what other people do. 
I work with instructors online that have told us that you know the discussion areas were for the students to discuss. It's not for the and that's sad. I mean, I, I encourage them to have a presence. It doesn't mean that you comment on every single thing a student says. In Don's course, he has 10 very rich discussions that occur every week. So it'd be impossible for him to reply to everything that every student says. Because essentially, when Don comes into the room and says something, it might squash the discussion. So his goal is to carry the conversation forward, make sure they're moving forward, make sure they're on the right track. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they are, that he's saying something about what every person has said. Right. Yeah. What else? Instructor presence. Yes. Uh, feel free to make announcements, but not uh, you know over the top, yeah. excessive. But you know that shows that you have a presence in your online course. That they're not just there learning along. Well. Reminders about the upcoming things, mm -hmm. due dates approaching, the ongoing discussion, those kinds of things. Just practice. Uh, those are things that you would do in a face-to-face -face class, exactly. right? And, yeah. and for some reason, it's. Uh, it's okay or, or acceptable for some folks to just not engage in the online environment. And I think I would feel really awkward not giving any student feedback for 16 weeks in a face-to-face -face class, but somehow that's, that's a thing that I have the option of doing in an online class. And you can do that with 16 students. Yeah. If we had a MOOC of 700 students, it would be difficult. The largest MOOC ever was 400,000 students from Udacity. And that's actually a computer science. But then I, I would gather that that doesn't really have a human. I mean, how could you possibly connect you know, in that way? So online presence. These scholars would define social presence as uh, the ability of participants to identify with the community, communicate purposefully in a trusting environment, and develop interpersonal relationships by a way of projecting their individual personality. One more definition I'd like to share is social presence is a degree in which an individual is perceived as a real person through mediated communication. Instructor presence is the design, facilitation, and direction of cognitive and social processes for the purpose of realizing per personally meaningful and educationally worthwhile learning outcomes. Is teaching online different than teaching in the classroom? We've kind of chatted a little bit about this, but can we just throw out maybe some buzzwords? Because we've talked about social presence and instructor presence. Do you feel like teaching is different online versus face-to-face? -face? Yes. 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 Yeah. So share with share with me why. No, not verbal cues. Yeah, you can't see the question marks hanging over your head. Okay. Like what else? It requires much more deliberate communication in that way. There's also the fact that class can take place when I'm not there. Um, yeah. I log yeah. on to class and class goes on overnight without me. Yeah. Good. And that changes a lot of things. And For so bad if you're not careful about it. <laughs> Depending on the student's level of involvement, they may not actually be completely communicating with each other as they fulfill requirements that may just be doing what they have to do and not learning from not be learning from the others as much. Right. That is possible for them to do. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's possible face to face too. Huh? That's possible face to face too. Uh, well at least they hear it so all right. I feel like there are plenty of times in class because I have to train students not just to talk to me in discussion to, mm -hmm. to speak to one another. Yeah. It has to do with our expectations, which we'll talk about setting up those up effectively. Any other last thoughts? Um, the, depending on how the course has been designed, uh, a student in an online class isn't necessarily limited to what's happening at that moment. Um, if they want to go on and you know to plow through other materials and, and, and do things on their own terms, whether that's you would like that or not, um, students have a little more control over that. And kind of that's part of Very different. The, yeah. on, on the, the design. Yes. But you can provide a face-to-face -face also experience in online class as well. Sure. I mean, secret, synchronous uh, communication. You can, yeah, and that would add more of that human, our, our learners desire something mm -hmm. that they can. Not every class has that. It's a challenge, though. So. It's I, a challenge. I had one student in Thailand, and you know, then you got other people who got, you know, a work week, and, you know, it's to define the time which everybody can do it. It's, it's really, it's, 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 I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's, 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 it's very difficult. 
I think in the face-to-face -face classroom, no matter what you do, you are the, as the teacher, you are the focus in the room, and online, you are not the focus. You are a facilitator. Mm -hmm. And I really like, I like both situations, but I, I really enjoy the less pressure online, because it's not a performance as much as the classroom is a performance. Yeah, and Kit, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more, how we, online, our goal was to put the student at the center of our instruction, and to get them to, to increase the collaboration between them and the instructor, between them and the content, and between them and each other. Mm -hmm. So this is a, an image that I love, of a blimp flying over the Los Angeles coastline. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna try to paint a quick a little analogy for us. So let's say we were to take a bunch of Webster students up in this blimp, and we were to take them over the Los Angeles skyline, and we're, our goal of that day is to teach them about urban sprawl. But instead of letting them look outside, we actually tell them to face the teacher in the front of the room who's holding up a globe. <laughs> How sad would that experience be? And I think we've heard about online courses that are like that, and maybe we have unfortunately even taught online courses that are like that, but like we know, our learners desire to use the technology, to be interactive with the technology, to, there's so much that we could do in the online environment to engage our students. So this is an image of a, of a student here looking outside of a blimp, but what I'm trying to get at is that us, as the captains of this blimp, essentially what we do in an online setting as a successful teacher is the same thing as what we do in a face-to-face -face classroom. If we're teaching, no matter if we're online or in the face-to-face -face classroom, we need to be experts in our content. We also need to stimulate intellectual development of our students, building rapport with our students, fostering student engagement. These bullets are from a book from Howard Bain, What the Best College Teachers Do from Harvard University, a pretty popular book in 2004. The next slide is some researchers went and they took this content from this book and they wrote what the best online teachers should do. And they took these points and they talked about how we can, and that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of the presentation talking about is how can we build rapport with our students and how can we foster student engagement. So the first thing I'm gonna do for these two sections here, I'm gonna kind of build the big, big concept. I'm gonna talk about these, kind of like what the research says, and then I'm going to share some other little pieces about them in terms of how I use it. But then I'm also very excited to hear about you, and we can all talk about in this. We're all a community, we're all excited to hear each other, we're all gonna leave here thinking about these things, so let's have the human element here in this, in this room today as well. So the first one, how do we, foster, how do we build rapport with students online? The authors of that book say we should let students know each other and their teacher, of course. Use introductory videos to introduce yourself to the class. Understanding one student population and determining the amount of help that they may need. And the next, next slide, just a few more bullets. Keep written records of communication that include relevant student information. We were already kind of chatting a little bit about doing that. Be flexible with your deadlines and due dates. Um, some people may do that in a face-to-face -face class, but not do it online, or vice, or vice versa. And also provide individual feedback on assignments and activities. So these are things I think we would all hope that we could do to build rapport with our students, but how do we actually do that? And the next thing is, which I'm gonna show examples of that in just a second. How can we foster student engagement online? Here's some suggestions that they had. Create a community of learners. Foster student-to-faculty and student-to-student -student interaction and a judicious use of humor. And lastly, how can we foster student engagement is create an engaging use of videos, maybe to introduce yourself, or even lecture content. These can be videos, podcasts, wikis, discussion forums. And then also we can use, perhaps use blogs to facilitate reflective thinking, collaborative learning, and knowledge construction. So what I'm gonna share some examples of from my own personal classes is in, in World Classroom, is I'm gonna share them in terms of, well first, like I just mentioned a minute ago, I would put the student at the center of my model, and I'm gonna figure out ways to increase their interaction with the content, increase their interaction with myself, and increase their interaction with each other. So, students to student, that could be obviously a community of learners, engaging on a discussion, in a discussion area, putting them in small groups. Student to content is working with the FTC, or the Online Learning Center, to create interactive content maybe with our online classes, to, to, so they can have a deeper engagement with, with that content. And then students to the instructor, that would be personalizing <coughs> feedback, flexible due dates and deadlines, and things like that. 
So these are the things I'm just going to quickly kind of run through some of, some of the things and show you some examples of how I've done that. Um, I'm going to show you my instructor introduction video that I used last summer. It's just a quick you know, minute and a half video where I'm actually inviting students to create videos. And I actually had one student of my 16 students last year create a video. And I'm going to show you his, his video that he created to introduce himself to the class. Um, quick online lecture videos, I'm going to show you just a quick little snippet of one that I use because in computer science there's so much that I need to demo for students. So, Lots of my course is actually then, I don't want them to be learning alone with a book. I want them to be actually seeing me teach them on how to do certain things in, uh, to build a website. Engaging online discussions, how in the world can you do that in a computer science course? I'm really excited to hear, I'm going to chat about some of my ideas and I've chatted with Janet who also teaches computer science to figure out how we can have some engaging online discussions in computer science. Uh, clear and flexible assignments. Clear would just mean setting up the expectations up front, making sure they know exactly what's expected of them. And um, because they're not really, it's very difficult for them maybe to ask you a question. So as clear as you can be up front. They're also going to be asking questions of why did I get a 98 out of 100 on my assignment? Mm -hmm. you know? So flexible with assignments in terms of maybe with due dates. And then also how do I personalize feedback? So the first one, instructor videos, the research here says, instructor introduction videos can help establish instructors teaching presence within the, with the students regardless of the method delivery of the course, either fully online, hybrid, flipped, et cetera. So I'm going to switch over to my classroom last summer and I'm going to show you my brief instructor video. So I did it as an announcement. We were talking about use of announcements earlier. Now the advantage of using Canvas is that, and one of the reasons why we decided to go to Canvas is because we can record these videos right within Canvas, have them up in Canvas, and you don't have to send them out to an external tool. You don't have to send them out to YouTube. You don't have to have some other program to record videos. As long as you have a webcam, you can record it right here. And you'll see my messy basement in the background. Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the class. Uh, my name's Dave, and I'll be your instructor this summer. And this is my office where I do most of my work as I teach a class online. Um, I know that all of you um, have your same work environments, perhaps that you're working in, and I just wanted to create this quick little video just to show you how easy it is uh, to just click that little video icon that... So it's very easy for us to create videos in Canvas and share them with students, and it's easy for them to do it as well. For the sake of time, I'm just going to jump to where, I've, at the end of the video, I'm inviting students to do the same thing. So now I'm going to show you one of my students who did record a video. So this is where I ask them to introduce themselves. So as you can see, this is a lot of rich discussion here with the students introducing themselves. And this student, Joseph Campbell, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's actually lives here in St. Louis. Hello, everybody. And he has a better setup for recording video than I do. But here's him introducing himself. My name is Joseph Campbell, but you can call me Joe. This is my first class within the web design program, but I have just recently completed my master's in information technology management from Webster. Um, I currently live in Florissant, Missouri, which is a suburb area, suburb county of St. Louis, but I've been born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. This is my home. Um, I work for AT&T Downtown St. Louis as an application developer where I do um, Java development, some JavaScript as well, um, and also some uh, testing. Uh, I have five children, which two, uh, with them, four of them mean two sets of twins. So I have two-year-old boy girls, I have a four-year-old son, and I have eight-year-old girls. Lord help me, please. <laughs> so obviously, these are. This is an example of our online students, very yes. busy, you know, things like that. Um, has any of you who teach online recorded introductory videos? I know Bud has. Them. Yeah. Well, actually, that's not. That's not completely true. I did like a video syllabus, so it's not. It's really more about the course. It wasn't about me, but sure. I'm thinking of maybe incorporating something more like that. Do you feel like my, my low fidelity recorded video, or even Joseph's video, do you feel like he has a presence yeah. in the course? He also participated quite a bit, and he did record a few videos here and there throughout the course, and I did try to as best as I could respond with video. And other students really felt like they knew Joe. You could actually see that students were asking Joe questions, you know, yeah. so I think it really increased his connection with the course. Huh. Quick lecture videos. Uh, I'm just going to kind of briefly run through some of these bullets, and you'll have access to this presentation later, but Think of these as a way to kind of take what you would do in a face-to-face -face class, how you would put that online so the students aren't just 
learning just from the textbook. They don't want to feel like they're learning alone. So here's some things that it said. Uh, using quick lecture videos presented the information in a way that the textbook or discussion forum could not. Made the courses more animated and more interesting. Um, the video was perceived as natural and helped clear up confusion on the content. I heard that quite a bit from my class because they go and they read it from the book, they try to do it themselves, but then they see a video of me doing it. They can pause the video and they essentially try to code exactly how I'm coding. Let me show you uh, an example. Similar to, uh, similar to um, what Chris was just saying, and my, I just prepared a video for my class this summer, and I'm going to show you that one. And I put it right here on the home page because I don't want students to miss it when they get it in my class next Friday. <laughs> so here, it's kind of like with the video syllabus. Essentially, it's not recording me. It's recording a demo of my what's going on on my screen. I'm showing them where everything is in the course. I'm talking through the expectation, just as it kind of would the first 10 minutes of class. I'd like to give you a quick tour of where things are located in the course because I want to make sure everyone knows exactly what's expected of them. And I don't want this new learning management system uh, to get in the way of you completing your expectation, completely fulfilling the expectations of you in the class to get the grade that you want. So as you can see, this is our home screen. Um, as things and activity goes on in the course, you will be getting feedback over here with links to it that will jump you into those assignments where you can receive that feedback. Um, all of our tools that are currently available are found right here, so you can quick so, get, so I'm basically giving them a quick tour of the course, a personal tour from me. Now if you work at the Online Learning Center, someone might help you record something like that, or we have other custom ones that are already built that we put into a course. Mm -hmm. Question first. I have a very technical question. Uh, is this particular one streaming from the video server as opposed to a video you uploaded using the media comment tool? This, uh, since what I do for the Online Learning Center is as a designer, those, I technically as I teach online, I'm not really I don't have access to a lot of those services because I don't want to overlap my two jobs. So I do put this on screencast.com, which okay. is when you record with Jane, you can upload the video straight to screencast.com and it provides you an embed code that then you can then use it. Yeah, course. just the reason why I ask is I think the, the fidelity of, of things that try to capture the on-screen details, when I, I did a screen capture of this to do the video syllabus and then they uploaded it using the media comment feature, which is fine for doing like a face the camera recording, mm -hmm. uh, that the resolution was such that a lot of the text was garbled. They were able to get, I mean, I'm there giving the narration and they can see where I'm clicking and all sure. that. They don't need to be able to read all of it. But I, I thought that there was a resolution issue there and this looked sharper to me and I was just curious. How yeah, I mean, I put this on screencast.com and you can, any resolution that you want to use it. But I would suggest working with the FTC and the Online Learning Center, we can help you record these types of things to, to put you in your online, in your online course. <laughs> Engaging online discussion. Students found that the discussion forums helped them to create a sense of belonging and community. Students that had the highest amount of social presence and had the highest scores, meaning that students with high social presence did better on assignments. So for the sake of time, because we're running late, I'm just going to kind of talk to you just kind of briefly about how I use discussions in online class. I'm trying to remember what I talked about in the last session and make sure I don't repeat it in this session. So if I repeat myself, just let me know. But basically, I teach uh, Co-op 2120, which is a course where I'm teaching them basically how to use Dreamweaver. And I actually want to, wanted to not just have them be a course where they're just learning a tool. I actually wanted them to give have a, a real experience with the client. So at the very beginning of the course, all of the students chose an author. So I've had students choose Edgar Allan Poe, Mary Shelley, and essentially they start working with Mary Shelley, who I become Mary Shelley, and I'm teaching them. I, they're talking to me as, hey, Mary Shelley, what would you like on your website about Frankenstein? So I kind of embed them in the scenario, and this is in a reflective journal area of the course, where the students have to go each week, ask their client questions. Everyone sees these questions. People can respond to them. People can ask other authors other questions and things like that. And the students are also posting examples of their sites to Mary Shelley, to Edgar Allan Poe, uh, <laughs> right there, right there in that journal area. That's one of the things that talk about how to foster engagement in an online course. I also, when I flip my classes, I sometimes teach on Round. I have the students show up to, before they show up to class, they're supposed to post three examples of websites online. So each week I give them a topic. It could be uh, like a, a forum on a website. So they're supposed to come with a bad example, a good example, and an ugly example. 
So they're supposed to share these in the discussion forum before they come to class. And essentially, they show up to class, and I have all the links here. I can bring them up. I can click on them, and I can call on them and say, hey, why did you choose this to be an ugly example? Why did you choose this to be a, be a good example? And then as a class, we all vote on the ugliest example of the user form. So that's just an example of how I've flipped my classroom. But there's lots of ways that you can kind of think about how to engage students in online discussions. I've consulted with, with Don and convinced him he needs to have discussion leaders in his course where students create their own discussion questions, certainly with their power to be leaders. And then that week, you might have two or three leaders in the class that are uh, posting a discussion for the whole class, and then the rest of the class kind of comes in and answers those questions. Um, another key thing about the discussion area that I always try to share with my instructors is that it's good to have expectations of when they're supposed to have their initial postings and when they're supposed to have their follow-up postings. Generally speaking, what we do is students have access to the discussions and all of the content on Sunday morning, and then they have until Saturday to complete the discussion or the assignment or something like that. But it's important to have that initial posting in the middle of the week where everyone gets their initial thoughts in the discussion area. And then the rest of the week, we're all responding to each other's questions or responding to each other's discussion closing so that we're not all just showing up at the very end of the week just throwing up our thoughts and then there's no real discussion happening. Um, another important thing to think about is, um, where was I going with that thought? Uh, maybe it'll come to me in a minute. But yeah, so engaging online, uh, having engaging online discussion. Any thoughts on how you all do your discussion questions online? I know Don might have, I'll use Don as an example because he's right here, but he might have 10 discussion questions week that are very heavy and rich. Does he require everyone to participate in every single one of them? No, he adjusts the expectations and maybe says, choose three. Because when you teach a face-to-face -face class, you don't ask everyone the same question. You know, wait for everyone to respond. So I think we try to figure out how to replicate that in an online setting. Sometimes people think, oh, they have to, we have to give them a grade for every single discussion question and require everyone to post, have an initial posting and have follow-up postings. But is that really how we do it in a face-to-face -face setting? Yeah, that's true. Well, what are some of the thoughts you have about discussions? Jan? Similarly, have them go out and bring something back. Yeah. And that tends to change students more. Yeah, I mean, especially for computer science, because it's, some of the questions you could ask in terms of computer science are very fact-oriented, you know. How do you do this? Well, essentially there's only one right answer. But can you show an example from your place of work? Can you show an example of this somewhere else online? So you're essentially bringing more content, more of the world, into your, into your course. A fun one is to find failures. Yeah. Because you go out and find project management failures. There are tons of them. Yeah. Governments. And they come back and they try to top one another. Sure. How much money was lost and blah, blah, blah. But it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Chris, you had a thought. Oh, I was going to say, and this is infeasible if you have like several running in any one given week, but just, you know, uh, just I've had instances in which I would ask a question in midweek and then it would go unanswered by that particular person. I'd respond to them, you know, so you kind of, you bring it to their attention, say, you know, you guys got to be in the habit of, of coming back here on a couple of different points <coughs> in time to, and just the, the fact that you participate in it and your questions go unanswered hopefully carries a little more, you know, uh, uh, currency with the students in terms of you know they want to they don't want to um, leave leave the instructor hanging. Yeah, I would say holding them accountable for what they're supposed to respond to, actually giving them the grade that they deserve. I keep sample communications of how I like this is an example of an email that I use to invite students to the course and tell them, that, hey, in a week you're going to be enrolled in this course. You know, be prepared. But what I'm trying to get at in terms of what Chris is saying is I have an example here of. I actually respond to their personal, I get all their personal emails through connections. So I have all their personal email addresses, and I actually ask them, which email do you want to use? But then I send them every week, I just send them a quick, you know, here's the assignments that you're supposed to do this week, whether they completed them or not, and their grade, and I also <laughs> inform them of the assignments that are coming up the next week. Because students, I know for me, I, by the time I go to bed, generally, I have checked all my email and deleted what I don't want, as best as I possibly can. Yeah. You know, so students, I guess, within the first few days are same way too, but they may not get into the course as much. So this essentially can, what Chris was saying is getting the students, and students into the course, even calling some of them out, sending them an email, hey, I noticed that you haven't been in the course yet. In the very beginning of the course, you kind of need to do a little bit more hand-holding, eventually the course just kind of moves ahead on its own. Another thing I'd like to show in terms of communication here, I have the students in the very beginning of the course share with me what their term projects are, what the term project is. So here's an example, and then I also share that with the entire class, so everybody in the class knows what everyone else's term project topics are. And then eventually I get to the point in the course where 
I actually have figured out a way where I can share their websites within the course. Uh, me and Janet are familiar with using Webster Lab Webs, but essentially no one has access to each other's lab webs. So what I do is I actually host their sites right here within the course. So essentially we can come here and we can click on Joseph's website, the guy we saw earlier, and we can view, all the students in the class can essentially view his website that he built for me right here within the course. Yay. <laughs> and he doesn't have to have, he doesn't have to have some kind of server space, he doesn't have to do that, any of that on his own. He's able to do it right here. So I can work with Janet and we can figure out how to make sure we can do that in, in her class. Uh, but basically, my goal is to have a community of learners, getting them all there, sharing, learning from each other, sharing examples, things like that. Because I'm not the center of the conversation. I want them to be. So you pretended to be Dr. Who for this one? No, he chose to do a website for, for Dr. Who. That's a different assignment. Though. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. In Co-op 2000, they I. For, for the basic web design class, what I just felt was the best for them to do is I tell them all the same topic. You have to choose a website that's based on a movie that you like or movies or a movie genre that you like. Then everyone's making movie websites. It's very easy to kind of talk about websites in terms of, well, because they're all going to have similar elements. Right. For the Co-op 2120 course, I actually teach it where they choose a client, so they choose a specific author from Project Gutenberg. Because when you go to Project Gutenberg, you have the entire text in the book. So when the mid, their midterm is they actually have to put the entire book of Mary Shelley in their website. Wow. It's all, all the text from the website's there, but they have to, I teach them how to get it from Project Gutenberg and put it on their site and then style it with a style sheet. And that's their midterm. No. Just a couple more slides, because I know lunch is about to happen. Clear and flexible assignments, we've already kind of talked a little bit about that. Personalized feedback. So students want to have a connection with you personally. And let me show you an example of how I'm doing that. Like I said earlier, students want to see, they want to know all the expectations for their assignments up front. They want to know exactly how they're going to be graded. For everyone's term project, here's an example of how I grade all of their term projects. So they know why they got a 98 out of 100. And they see personally how I'm grading them right here. Dave, where, where, where is this document? on the site because I give them feedback where they upload but sometimes they say to me I didn't get any feedback because they don't know where to look mm -hmm. for yeah, it's yeah. Fun. in the rubric that's built within Canvas mm -hmm. this isn't built within Canvas but in the rubric that, the reason I didn't build it within Canvas because Canvas isn't robust to do what I wanted to do with yeah. the feedback so I actually send this to them on email uh -huh. but okay. but what you could do as well you don't actually have to use the rubric Okay. But in Canvas, when they when you complete someone's feedback and you give them a grade, they'll get a notification that says, hey, your assignment's been graded by Kit. And then they might not know that there's a rubric attached to it. Yeah. In the There's different ways you can, you actually can send them a note along with that feedback, and I would say in that note, be sure you click the link yeah. to, to see, see the comments rubric. too. Yeah, see the comments. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, if they're not invited to click comments. the link, they may not ever go into the course and see why they got a 98. Yeah. Well, the, the name of the icon, or the name of the link changed this semester and oh, really? helps students on the summary page of their grades. Uh -huh. They have to click a different symbol mm. to see it because my students couldn't find it either. Um, okay. And I, I'd have to recommend the new markup tool. And Canvas is wonderful. You can circle stuff and draw stuff. And mm -hmm. But the challenge for That's us fine. computer science instructors, Janet, is how do I then give them feedback on those websites? Yeah. So I use Snagit. So in Snagit, I take screenshots of their websites, I take screenshots of their root folder, and I'm able to draw and I'm able to show them specifically how I'm graded them. Does Webster have a license for that? Webster does. Yeah. How do we give them feedback? And this is uh, someone who made a website about Torchwood. It's a British TV show. Mm -hmm. How do I give them feedback about their code? I take screenshots of their code, mm -hmm. and I'm specifically able to show them on their code right there where the problem is. What's this called? Snagit. Snag Snag yeah. Snag yeah. Snag TechSmith is the company that makes it. TechSmith also makes Jing and Camtasia, um, mm -hmm. tools that I use heavily in how I design and teach my courses. Mm -hmm. But before I did this, I would send them an email saying, hey, you need to make sure that you check your how you're forming your table. And, and some problems here, but now I can actually show them exactly what the problem is. Any questions before I show some final slides? How about, let me show the final slides and then we can just chat for the remainder of the time. So basically <laughs> what I wanted to share with you, um, those of you, I'm hoping you're very, still very interested in your flipping your classroom and I'd like to find out Concerns you still have, so let's come back to that. But I do want to show 
If you're interested in what we've been talking about in terms of social presence, if you go to the University of Athabasca's website, if you just type, go to Google and type COI space Athabasca, you're going to get to a website that talks about a community of inquiry. Community of inquiry is basically um, three different things. It's social presence, instructor presence, and cognitive presence. And I'm going to show you their website. So again, it's coiathabasca.ca, but you can just go to Google and type COI Athabasca and you'll find it. They have this great interaction here on the homepage that kind of just gives you a brief overview of, those, of their framework. And today we talked about instructor presence. You can actually click on here. Somewhere hang on. You click on here, you can get the definition. So just an example of interactive. But I talked specifically today about social presence and instructor presence, but also there's a, the element of cognitive presence as well. Another thing I'd like to make mention of is we use this research in that MOOC I was mentioning on the Canvas network. Um, so if you're interested, let me know and I can make sure to invite you to the MOOC. It's free. It's not through Webster, but me and some other uh, colleagues of mine from, uh, that I know from down in Texas, we have this MOOC called uh, The Human Element, an Essential Online Course Component. It's organized over four weeks. We actually have a week zero where they're kind of just students getting in and getting to know each other. Social presence, which is my week, and we also have instructor presence and cognitive presence. So we actually, we actually able to try out certain tools like VoiceThread, which Webster doesn't have access to, but it's, you can actually see how it's used. So maybe if we get enough to say Webster needs VoiceThread, maybe we'll get VoiceThread. Uh, we also try out using Twitter for a classroom. We talk about that. We, we actually have some Twitter chats that go on during that week at different times. Um, so something you might be interested in. Um, last year, we had about 700 people join the MOOC. And like I said, I think we only had about 100 active participants, and we only ended up with about 56 people that actually completed the MOOC and earned a badge that they can show on their uh, on the Canvas network as them having social presence. Hmm. That's still a very high percentage for me. 56 students out of 700. Yeah, yeah because out of what was it, 140,000, they had oh yeah, 14 or something you know, at MIT. And here's just a list of my references for this presentation. And yes, we will be sharing this with the FTC, and then you'll have access to it. But also email me or connect with me, and I can send it to you as well. So let's spend the rest of our time maybe chatting about this last question here, which was if you're interested in flipping your classroom and what concerns you have. Or what concerns do you have about maybe social presence online? There's one point you made earlier on about those who are more heavily engaged end up doing better on assign assessments, assignments, get better grades. <clears throat> that ends up being, there's, that worries me in terms of the elitism of those who can do better. How or do have more time that? to participate. Perhaps so. But the, the end result of coming that those who know this stuff better means we have a problem. Well, Not the goal, for them, but for well, yeah. the other ones. Well, yeah, I mean, the goal of the Online Learning Center FTC is to take the technology out of the equation. We want to make it very easy right. for instructors to teach from. We also want to make it very easy for students to learn from. So we went with Canvas because it's the, in our opinion, we believe that it was the best platform to go through to right. increase student learning. It was very easy and intuitive for them to use. So I would say that those students that are more actively engaged are spending time with each other, learning more about the material, getting diverse perspectives and opinions, you know. But I've had some students come to me and say, Dave, I don't have the ability to really participate as much in this class. You know, do you think I should drop? And I would probably work with them and consult with them to see if that is the best. I thought that meant those more who were already more engaged in social media end up doing that. Did okay. I misread that? Yeah. No. Oh. Yeah. Some people, like those of you in here who don't have any experience with social media, you still teach online. You're still teaching very online very well. I would say that students are come, our students most likely, many of them are coming into these classes with experience in social media and they're wanting that same experience mm -hmm. online. That's kind of one of the points of the presentation. And maybe those are the, the tw those are the 21st century skills that, that can maybe can jump into an online course and really learn it really well. But then we also have learners who come in that may be uh, an older generation that's difficult mm -hmm. for them to kind of come in and learn the platform and, and test it out and, and use it. And so they have to spend time learning this new environment. So we want to make that transition as easy for them as possible because the point of the class isn't learning the environment. The point of the class is learning the content and interacting with the instructor. Eric. Well, I mean, you and I have kind of talked about this informally in a few situations, but I mean, I think one concern that I have and, and in some of the evaluations that I see for our faculty, our program is completely online. I mean, one of the 
one of the motivations, at least initially, for students to, to take an online course is allegedly, you know, convenience kind of thing, right? But the more, and I think your mission is a good one, but I mean, I think the more structure you put in place to ensure that there is engaged discussion and you have to discuss things within this window and respond to so many posts by this other time, that's the thing that um, a lot of instructors get dinged on in evaluations. And that's the thing that actually makes it um, less convenient for students and probably more work for faculty when you have all of these very, very specific expectations and kind of almost barriers to engagement. I would say everyone has their own teaching philosophy. So set your expectations up, letting them know, like, hey, I'm about to be out of town. Or generally, I'm only going to be able to respond to questions heavily between Tuesday and Wednesday, Tuesday through Thursday, or something like that. And if you can, online learning would recommend that you have a 48-hour turnaround to questions, as best as you can. Because when students come into your classroom, you know, they ask a question, they get immediate feedback right there. We want to try to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Online. Question? In, in terms of your presentation, I heard Eric saying, if, if I, as a student, sign up for an online class thinking it's thinking that what I'm looking for is the fast food drive through yeah. and then you're trying to provide a, a much better dining experience for me, that, that mismatch might leave me really frustrated. Even though I ended up learning more than I thought I was going to, I've been frustrated because I thought I was going to get in again. Yeah, that's some, some courses really need it. Yeah. Some a computer science course. Maybe not so much. So I'm politely, I only, that's only for me, it's like 20% of my grade. Yeah. You know, some courses like Don's, 60% of his grade Ooh. to get in there and talk about, what, what's the course that you do that? I don't know what you want to watch. I think it's like religion and something. Yeah. But I mean, that's the whole point of the course is for them to in there engaged in diverse conversations. Mm -hmm. Chris. And one thing that, it's, it's a recurring theme, I talk about meta, I teach the online course of how to design an online course. Um, and so you kind of have to talk the, 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 you have to walk the talk as you talk in terms of best practices and all that. And so in student to student interaction is one of those three pillars uh, uh, between content, student, and instructor. Um, but uh, the one thing that comes up in the literature that they, that they read and also comes up with their own experience is that sometimes we have to divorce the idea of what we like versus what is effective. Um, ideally, both occur, but uh, there were some times where people didn't like the discussions, but they would acknowledged they were effective, or, they, or they'd say they didn't like it and it wasn't effective. The same was true, I created a group three group assignments, which were widely reviled, and yet when I asked them if they would do it as instructors themselves, they're like, yeah, I, I would do that as an instructor too. So sometimes, um, I say sometimes just, we should have conflated what is liked versus what adjust, is Adjust your expectation. <laughs> adjust, figure out how to adjust your expectation. When you students all come to class, you're not expecting everyone to respond to every question that you have. Do you do group work in your class? If you don't do it face to face, why would you do it online? You know, I mean, so I would say figure out what works best and use the shell that you get from online learning or what you're given from the FTC as just kind of that place to. I always love to use the analogy of, you know, you have this course, you have this pre-manufactured home, but essentially, as the instructor, your goal is to entertain your dinner guests when they come into your home. You're supposed to decorate the house, plan this nice meal, you know, but it's up to you to figure out how to adjust adjust what's there. Make it work what best, what's best for you, what's effective for you to teach, and what's effective for the, for the learners. Jamie. two concerns about social media. Uh, one is that there's a financial uh, burden for some students. And they may, while we think it's ubiquitous, you can go to get free internet access at a library. But you may not be able to participate in some of the other things, probably. Yeah. And it's the same as I tell you, if you need a binder, this is not designed to be a financial burden. Come to me, and I've got some spare binders. Fine. Yeah. But that, that's a concern. Um, and the other is that we have so many channels of communication going if we don't pick a focus. And that, that's what I'm debating now, is you end up with information overload or redundancy. And you have to put every message out there in five formats. So that, that, you know, for the recipient, that can't be good. Yeah, I mean, teaching but redundancy of communications channel is good for error checking. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Simple <laughs> redundancy checks. CRC codes are excellent, as a matter of fact. Because you're right, some Perfect. people might miss the announcements, some people might not be yeah. as involved in the discussion, but as you're the pilot of the blip, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You're there to kind of guide them and show them. Like I send them those weekly update emails. I know they're going to check their email. You know, yeah. granted there's there's logistics or things to think about when you're having communications that are stored outside the course because that's an archive with the course. That's so students I can really, come. So a student can come back and be like, oh, I never heard from my instructor, and there's no proof of it because you did everything in email. You right. know, so you have to balance it. Yeah. So I do. I send emails and I drive them to go into the course and find the things that I'm telling them. I don't allow them to submit things to me. I, yeah, I, you know. I only use Canvas for that communication. And not everyone sets right. up their profile and notifications, so but they may not be getting the communications that you're getting. But like there's training and things that you can lead them to to, sh to share and say, hey, you should get to And when I find your stuff in junk mail, because mm -hmm. they sent it from some goofy yeah. address. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> say, oh, I just found this. Yes, four days later. <laughs> So what are what are the thoughts do you have? Well, the online learning center and the MTC looks forward to working with you to to build these types of maybe it's fast food course or maybe it is a uh, maybe it is a course where you're inviting people over for dinner. But I think that you know the point is you know depending on the objectives of the student, the the instructor, the institution, you know, figuring out how to have the best learning experience.